everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, Eight Tips to Find Influencers and Convince Them to Help You. Uh, today, we have a very special guest with us, Jay Baer. Um, he's a New York Times bestselling author, global keynote speaker, and digital media entrepreneur. Um, he also works with Convince and Convert, who uh, is one of my favorite partnerships to work with. My name is Gina Mueller. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Insight Pool, and I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar. However, to start things off, I am going to just walk you guys through the GoToWebinar control panels. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll notice that there's an, a tab for questions. So at any time, if you have any questions uh, during the webinar, feel free to post them there, and we will be uh, addressing all questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, this session today will be recorded, so if you need to leave for any reason or um, if you want to share it with someone after the webinar, then we will be sending out the recording tomorrow. Uh, we, so uh, if you also, another way to participate in today's conversation is on Twitter, and that's by using the hashtag influencer tips. Um, so please join us in the conversations there and feel free to post any questions you have in either the GoToWebinar control panel or in Twitter. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Devin Widgesinger, who will be uh, presenting with Jay Bear today. Devin? Hey, everyone. Uh, uh, great to have you guys here. And uh, what I think you, you'll find is that's really different about uh, this webinar, and particularly Jay specifically, is that he actually has his hands dirty. Um, one of the best things I love about Jay is that he does not live in the stratospheric clouds of people that may be called influencers. Like, he actually uses things. He actually does it himself. Um, and he, he has really hands-on experience and can speak to it from a ground level. So I think uh, it's going to be an awesome education. I know uh, I learn a lot every time I talk to him. So uh, without further ado, um, I can... You can easily read uh, Jay's bio, and again, uh, you know, it kind of comes with, without saying it, but I mean, the world's number one content marketing blog, um, you know, Convince and Convert, which is one of the best known and most successful consulting companies that works with brands on social and, and content specifically. But again, like, the very best thing that I can possibly say is that he's not somebody that's kind of lost touch because he hasn't been in it. Um, he has, and he brings a lot of um, science as well as the art to if you're you know, in a company and trying to move things forward, how to actually do that and, and real data to be able to present, whether it be to your bosses or executive committees or whatnot, to be able to truly push your company forward uh, using content from Jay's, Jay is just a, is amazing because it's so ground level. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to you know, hand the reins off to, to Jay as you showed up here to listen to him and not to me uh, and uh, kind of fade off into the background. So Jay, would you mind taking it? I will take it, Devin. Thanks very much for that kind introduction. Fantastic to be here with my friends from Insight Pool and all of you. I am, in fact, Jay Bear. I am not, in fact, wearing that suit right now. Here's the question that we all need to answer, which is why are influencers important? Why do we care about this? Obviously you care about it, otherwise you wouldn't be on this webinar. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, there is an explosion of content and social interactions, and there's more and more all the way. on the way. I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't already know when I say that there is much, 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 much more content being created right now than there was five years ago, even a year ago. Companies like mine are creating content, companies like Devon's are creating content, you're creating content, that's why you're on this webinar. All of your competitors are creating content. Most of your customers are creating content. There is a glut of content out there, everybody fighting for the same little sliver of attention. And we're at a point now, and I think you realize this, that if you build something, if you have a blog, if you have a SlideShare program, if you have a webinar, if you have a series of video, who cares, right? It used to be if you build it, you'll attract an audience. Now, if you build it, so what? It's harder than ever to get eyeballs on something. And so in a massive competitive environment like we're in right now, amplification of content, connecting content to audiences is just as important and perhaps more so than actually creating the content itself. And so the promise of influencer marketing, the premise of influencer marketing is that working with influencers gives your story reach 
and impact that working with influencers takes your story and gets it in front of more people than you normally could do without those influencers. That's the way it works in theory. In practice, it doesn't always work that way. Uh, I see a lot of companies wasting time and wasting money on influencer marketing right now because they don't understand the eight tips that we're going to share with you today. Uh, I've done lots and lots of these kind of campaigns, not only on on behalf of my clients at Convince and Convert, uh, as Devin so so kindly said, we do a lot of experimentation, a lot of testing in my organization. Uh, as a long-term digital marketer, I've been in online marketing now for 23 years. Uh, I, I come from a background of testing and optimization, and so we're always trying new things. And unfortunately, I see a lot of people now wasting time and wasting dollars in the influencer marketing pursuit. So we're going to try and save some of those heartaches here today with the eight tips that we're going to tell you. The first tip around influencer marketing, how to find influencers and get them to do what you want them to do, is you have to build a business case for influencer marketing. You have to understand exactly why you're doing this at all. Fundamentally, you don't need, quote unquote, influence. You don't need it. Influence has no net present value in in a vacuum. It doesn't actually have, it's not currency, right? It's not money. You don't really need influence. What you really need, my friends, is what influencers can theoretically bring, which is, as I mentioned, reach and impact. But even then, to to what end? To what end do you need reach? To what end do you need impact? How does that actually improve your company? How does it make you money or save you money or both? Because fundamentally, there's really only three reasons to get involved in influencer marketing at all. There's only three reasons to do this. The first is awareness. I'm moving from right to left. The first is awareness. And and in a circumstance like that, influencers would spread your story to people who otherwise might not be exposed to it, right? I think a lot of us probably have blogs and you might have a company blog or a personal blog or both. And, and the people who read your blog generally speaking, are people who already know you, right? They already know your company. They already know your products and services. You are, in a very real way, preaching to the converted. So in an awareness context, influencers can spread your story to new audiences, people who don't already know you. And in this role, as it says at the bottom of the slide here on the right-hand side, in this role, influencers are essentially cheerleaders for the brand. The second option would be to use influencers in a sales context. And in this way, influencers can cause very specific, very desirable behaviors to occur among your target audiences. And and those behaviors are often things like clicks. We want people to visit this landing page or purchases. We want people to buy this product or participate in a Kickstarter or something along those lines or downloads, which are often uh, on the way to purchase. So we want uh, people to download our new free ebook or sign up for a webinar for that matter. And in this role, influencers are essentially direct response vehicles. It's the same thing uh, that, that you would use a coupon for or a direct mail piece or a banner ad. Uh, influencers are, are playing that role. And then the third reason that you might want to get involved in influencer marketing is for loyalty, where influencers cause existing customers to become advocates, to renew, et cetera. That is where you see much of celebrity endorsements, right? So uh, if if people look at Matthew McConaughey for Lincoln, for example, you've probably seen those television commercials. Matthew McConaughey purports to drive a Lincoln. He, he drove one before anybody paid him to drive one, or so he says in the commercials. And other people who have a Lincoln are now like, yeah, man, Matthew McConaughey drives a Lincoln too. I feel pretty good about that. I'm going to make sure I buy another one. Right? You're using influencers to create a loyalty effect. And in this role, influencers are essentially advertising vehicles in a, uh, in a, in a indirect sense, or in the McConaughey's example, in a very direct sense. So awareness, sales, loyalty. Those are the three reasons why you might use influencers. And you have to understand very clearly which of those you are trying 
to execute on. You can't just say, we need some influencers to do some stuff. That's not going to get it done. You have to understand, are we trying to grow awareness? If so, measure that. Are we trying to grow sales? If so, measure that. Are we trying to grow loyalty? If so, measure that. The second tip that Devin and I have for you today is to learn the difference between audience and influence. And in fact, if I had to, for reasons that, I don't know, maybe we're, we're going to do this on Snapchat or something. If I had to say, you only should remember one tip, this is the tip you need to remember. If you, if you forget everything else we say today, remember this. Learn the difference between audience and influence. As an industry, as marketers, we use the term, quote unquote, influencer marketing as a catch-all term to describe lots of different uh, permutations of working with other individuals who are not employees, et cetera, uh, to spread your message. But many of the people that, that we think of as influencers, quote unquote, don't actually have influence. See, influence means that you incite a behavior or a belief, not just that you created impressions. Influence means that you can cause a behavior or a belief. Some people have influence. Other people have an audience. But it's incredibly important to understand that those are circumstantial and topically specific. Somebody who is influential about something is not necessarily influential about some other thing. It is a sliding scale based on circumstance, audience type, who the influencer is, the source of that influence, etc. Let me show you a couple of examples. So if you look at my social graph, this is my, my personal social graph. Uh, on Twitter, I have 160, I think it's 166,000 followers now. Uh, so that would be my total audience. If, if you need to get something accomplished, if you need to work with an influencer, quote unquote, in social media, and you're trying to get somebody aware of something like Insight Pool, uh, I might be a good candidate. The audience is 164,000. Uh, I believe, based on some work I've done with Insight Pool and others, that approximately 80,000 of those people have a distinct and known um, uh, sort of desire to learn more about social media, right? So almost half of the audience is interested in social media, which is probably not surprising given the things that I talk about and what I do for a living. But when you talk about actual influence, right? The ability to create behavior, it's about 1600 people at any given time. I say that because anytime I send out a tweet with a link, the average click-through rate on tweets that I send is 1%. Now it varies, sometimes more, sometimes less, but 1% is average. So that's 1% of an audience of 164,000 and approximately 2% um, of, of an interested audience of 80,000, okay? That's not bad, that's, that's how it works. Now, let me look at a different scenario. Imagine that you had a business that was founded on the principle of making sure that people learn how to be good rock climbers. You've got a chain of rock climbing gyms throughout the U.S. and you say, hey, we need to do an influencer marketing campaign. We should get Jay Bear to, to help us do a webinar or an ebook or do some guest blogging or make a video or whatever idea that you, uh, that you cook up. Let's get Jay to help us. Here's the problem. I still have an audience of 164,000, but only 2,000 of those people know about, care about, or are interested in rock climbing. And if you use the same sort of click-through rate scenario, you're going to get 200 clicks, maybe less, right? I still have the same audience, but my influence in the area of rock climbing is very, very small, whereas my influence in social media is relatively large. And this is the fundamental mistake that, that people are making all the time, is they're confusing an audience with the ability to influence. Because if you're the rock climbing company, you're much better off working with somebody who is a rock climbing expert. Because very, very rarely, very rarely do you really care about impressions and reach. 
I mean, you're not just looking for eyeballs, right? You're almost always seeking actions. And audience and influence are not correlated. It's not the same thing. You can have great influence with a narrow audience. So look at it this way. Let's say you find somebody uh, who is a rock climbing expert and their audience is 20,000 people total. 15,000 of them are interested in rock climbing. That person might be able to generate 3,000 clicks to whatever piece of content you've created even though their total audience is much smaller because the concentration of that audience is so pure, right? They are, they are the, the guru for that micro uh, segment of, of the population. So you're much better off working with this person than you are working with me, even though when you measure the audiences against one another, this person's audience is much smaller. The third tip is to craft a story worth telling. Influencers amplify a story. They shouldn't be the story. The way this works in practice, and we'll show you some more about this in a minute, is that you have something, you have a program, you have an idea, you have an opportunity, and you want the influencer to participate or promote it in some way. The, the, the story itself isn't the influencer, right? So you have to have something, a hook, a program, an idea, a tactic, a campaign that is interesting and unique enough that the influencers in question actually want to use their power to talk about it. Right. They, they have to want to embrace it. It has to be interesting enough, cool enough, relevant enough, different enough that, that they're like, yeah, I absolutely want to participate. And this really matters. You know, influencers um, in particular segments get get asked to do a lot of things. And and the, the novelty of the thing that they are asked to do has a huge determinant on whether they participate. The fact that your business exists, the fact that you have a company is not a sufficiently compelling story. For somebody to say, "Oh yes, please let me." I mean, and I get this all the time. I don't. I don't want to, um, you know, demean anybody. I'm not trying to do so. But but I get emails every single day, every day, that say, "We just um, launched an app. Would you like to tweet about this and share it and write a blog post about it and make videos about it?" And I'm like, "Well, not really. I mean, the fact that you have an app is not." is not news. Um, it's not news to me. It's not news to anybody. Um, so you have to have a story that is interesting. The story comes first. Influencers come second. And I see this misplaced all the time. Uh, people say, what we need is an influencer marketing campaign. Great. And then they figure out what they're going to ask the influencers to do. And that is absolutely backwards. Figure out your story and what you need influencers for, then go find the influencer. So story comes first. And I have a graphic here. Um, we have a brand new podcast that we launched just a few weeks ago. It's amazing. It was uh, number four uh, on the iTunes business podcast charts at launch. It's called The Business of Story. It's a weekly show all about using uh, Hollywood storytelling principles in your business. And if you want to tell better stories and craft better programs. It's a really terrific show hosted by my friend uh, Park Howell and, uh, and produced by our folks at Convince and Convert. Fourth tip, and this is not sexy. I'm going to tell you right now that this is not a sexy concept, but it works. And I really encourage everybody listening today to, to think inside out when you're working on amplification programs, influencers, et cetera. Find people inside your organization that love you genuinely without being asked or told. Start there and then work your way out. See, your current customers, whoever they are, they can be the most powerful influencers you have, even if they don't have a huge audience. And this is because they possess the power of personal experience, right? They know your business is good. They know your product is good. They know your service is good. And they can provide credible testimony that moves the needle. Let me go back to my Matthew McConaughey example. The reason those commercials have been effective and successful for Lincoln is because he actually bought the car before they made him a spokesperson. 
Let me contrast that with some other commercials um, that you may have seen in the past in the same industry. You may remember before he became a, a pariah and a not very good golfer, when Tiger Woods was was on top of the world, one of his primary uh, endorsements was with Buick. And you would consistently see commercials on television with Tiger Woods sitting in a Buick automobile saying how much he liked a Buick. Now, I'm not anti-Buick, my friends, but I want you to think. Do you believe that Tiger Woods actually bought and drove a Buick organically before he had a paid endorsement? There's no way. There is no way that is true. I just do not believe it. I do believe that Matthew McConaughey had a Lincoln, which is why as a current customer who has credible testimony, you have the ability to move the needle and be a very, very strong influencer, even if you don't have a large audience. Of course, McConaughey does, but your customers may not. And so we have worked on some programs like this at Convince a Giver with um, Devin and the team at, at Insight Pool. Uh, we wrote a blog post all about uh, this campaign that we did with them. I published it a couple of weeks ago. It's actually available in the uh, free resources and the PDFs you'll see on the right-hand side of your webinar console if you want to check out the, the case study. But I'll give you a little uh, summary of how it worked here. So our blog, convertcom as Devin said, very popular blog. Many of you may have read it. I hope that you do. Uh, earlier this year, we sh changed our entire email program, which is very, very scary because we had a very large uh, and popular email program to begin with. Uh, we used to publish an email every day, Monday through Friday. It was called The One Thing. And The One Thing would uh, would send you as a subscriber uh, the, the thing that we thought was the most important story of the day in the world of social media, content marketing, and digital marketing. It was, if you can only read one thing today, read this thing. And so it was it was time sensitive. Here's what happened on Tuesday, et cetera. Well, we decided uh, strategically that, you know, a lot of people do that. There's a lot of emails out there that are based on on, you know, kind of curation and here's what's, you know, going on today or this week or what happened. And, you know, I think we can do something different. So we changed our entire email program to what you see here. It's called Definitive. And the way Definitive works is that it's a topical email, not a timely email. So we send it out Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, but each day is devoted to a particular topic. So Mondays is digital, Tuesdays is social, Wednesdays is content, etc. And so on a particular day, we will go out and find the three best articles, resources, whatever about that topic ever produced. Some of them come from us. Most of them, frankly, do not. So uh, today's email, which will go out here in about an hour, is all about Facebook retargeting ads. So if you want to know about Facebook retargeted ads, we're going to send you an email and it's going to have the three best things ever written about that. If you need to know it today, great. If you need to know it somewhere down the road, you can access the archives. So it was a very, very scary, scary decision because we took a very large list and said, we're going to change everything about this overnight. Well, what we needed to do then after we made the change was to let a lot of our existing audience, current customers, know about the change and get them talking about how great this new version was. So we worked with Devin and the Insight Pool team, and we took our existing email list and the Insight Pool uh, folks found many, many, many of our uh, email subscribers on Twitter. Here's just a little cross section of some of our, our friends and subscribers here. And then we, we took those folks and we created a number of different tweets to let them know about our shift from our old version of our email to our new version of the email. In case maybe they didn't see it, it goes into their, uh, their spam box, which sometimes happens, of course, as you know, uh, et cetera. So we wanted to make sure that our best current customers knew we made this shift and get them talking about uh, the new email product. So using the Insight Pool software, we were a lot, uh, able to reach a lot of the people in our audience with, with relatively minimal effort. Could we have done this manually? Yes, we could have done this manually, but it would have taken 
a lot of time. Using Insight Pool, we were able to do it much faster, much more efficiently, have great analytics, and it was an enormous success. In fact, subscriptions to the new email product are up 21% uh, since we made the switch, which is uh, really exciting. Uh, one of the things we like about working with Insight Pool, as you see on this slide here, this is just a tiny excerpt of the really detailed reporting that you get on engagements and uh, interactions with, with individuals that you've uh, pulled out of your audience, et cetera. So it worked great. Uh, we'll have Devin talk a little bit more about the specifics in a, uh, of Insight Pool in a little bit, but this idea of using your current customers as the first circle of influence is really, really important. In fact, this is another company uh, that I love. I actually wrote about these guys in my new book, uh, Hug Your Haters, which comes out first part of next year. It's a company called Needle. It's needle.com. And, and this is just so smart. So what they do is they take existing customers, uh, typically in an e-commerce environment, and they say, okay, who are our customers who are, who are advocates, right? Who, who really love this product? And then they train them and they have those customers answer the live chat on the website and say, hey, would you like to uh, learn more about Canon cameras from an actual Canon customer? You're like, well, yeah, I would like to learn about cameras from an actual customer. That sounds fantastic. As opposed to a call center person from God knows where, that sounds awesome. Uh, and so an actual customer, an actual advocate guides you around the site and answers questions and helps you do things. Uh, so needle.com does that. And then your, your advert advocates actually make a little bit of commission on anything they sell. There's a lady, uh, her name is Barry, and she is an advocate for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. And last year, just doing this live chat, helping people figure out which cruise to go on and which ship to book. And should you get this excursion? If you've ever been on a cruise, there's lots of questions and things you have to decide in advance. It's really kind of confusing. And so she knows everything. She's like cruise genius. And so people rely on her and live chat with her. Last year, Barry, one lady sitting in her kitchen with a laptop, sold $12 million worth of cruises. Advocates is where you should start. Focus on people who are already customers, get them fired up, create programs with them, and then reach out to influencers who aren't already your customers. The fifth tip is to discover people who have a relevant audience next. And, and so what I mean by that is, as we, we looked earlier, I'm influential, I guess I would say, about social media, manifestly less so about rock climbing. Uh, I don't want to, to climb rocks. I certainly appreciate that as a sport, but it's not my thing. I'm an avid endorsement. Um, so you have to find people who have a relevant audience. And, and there are multiple ways to do that, right? Multiple ways to, to find the appropriate influencers. There are literally dozens, maybe even hundreds of specific uh, opportunities that you can do that, but, but I've categorized them into three, sort of three ways, if you will, to do this. The first is DIY, right? Where you just kind of hunt and peck and you use Google and you're kind of messing around on Twitter and you know somebody who has uh, influence about a particular topic and you see who that person is connected to and you just kind of cobble together your own list of people and and that is your influencer list. That is doable, right? It's not impossible to, to do this yourself. It's just really time intensive and it and it doesn't give you very good analytics or, or a sense of, of comparative statistics when you're measuring one potential participant against another. The second option is a software assisted search. There's lots of software packages uh, out there that will help you find and identify and sort and score and rank and measure and contact different influencers around different to uh, topics. And I'll talk to you about that in just a second. And the third option is a marketplace. There are uh, a number of companies out there and more all the time that, that have relationships with influencers already. And you come to the marketplace and say, hey, guys, we need somebody who is influential about home repair, or we need to work with some people who are influential about barbecue, or we need people who are really good at Snapchat. 
and the marketplace already has relationships. They almost function as an agent, if you will. Uh, and the marketplace will go find the influencers and kind of put the deal together on behalf of, of your company. On the software assisted uh, side, that kind of middle uh, opportunity, a bunch of different uh, companies who can help you with that. Obviously, Insight Pool, uh, we use them all the time, helps find people who follow uh, your competitors and don't follow you, which is a, a terrific uh, opportunity. Who follows uh, your competitors but don't follow you and then you can approach those folks. Uh, Group High is software that that uh, helps you identify particular bloggers. Little Bird is a company I'm invested in that, that helps um, people find top topical experts on Twitter and beyond. Cision, which is a very uh, large platform, been around for a long time, an amazing uh, piece of technology, helps find bloggers and social media influencers by topic and geography, also has traditional media uh, relationships in their database, and there's lots more companies in the software-assisted discovery area. On the marketplace side, where they, where they, serve, where they kind of work as an agent, you've got a few different uh, organizations here. There's lots more than, than we have on the slide. Tap Influence uh, matches companies to online influencers across a lot of different platforms and helps them kind of produce campaigns. Uh, Del Mondo uh, is a, a new marketplace that matches companies specifically to Snapchat influencers. Grape Story matches companies specifically to Vine influencers. Uh, Snapfluence matches companies specifically to Instagram influencers. So you can see how specific this, this business is getting where you've got companies that, that can just locate Instagram influencers, et cetera. It's pretty fascinating. I'm going to uh, give it over to, to Devin. I'll go ahead and keep the slide control, Devin, but uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about Insight Pool and how they work uh, specifically, and then I'll come back with the uh, tip six. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, you know, I think the, the interesting part is that word of mouth used to be something that just simply happened, and when it happened, it was – Wonderful, but very hard to quantify or very hard to recreate, right? Word of mouth used to be that you were talking to your neighbor about something and then you took that action, but um, the equivalent of trying to figure out where that actually came from uh, was almost impossible. So merchants really had no ability to try and incite that behavior. Um, and then the advent of social media came, and all of a sudden, it's this digitization of humanity, and word of mouth came roaring back because consumers nowadays really only trust who they're connected to. The reality is, is if you look at a very basic human activity today, and I talk about this a lot, but how many people actually answer their phone if they don't recognize the number? Basically, nobody. Almost everybody in the room, every time I ask it, everybody simply says that they don't do it. And so the interesting part is, is that we've you know, uh, become accustomed to only wanting to engage with parties that we have seeked out a relationship with. And that how we're influenced by that comes from peers. And so I, you know, this statistic is by Nielsen that talks you know, a bit about 92% trust recommendations from people that they know, um, whereas 36% trust brand content. Very interesting. I think Nielsen said 92% because... If they said 100, that would not sound like a real statistic. I don't know what the other 8% uh, actually trust, but it's for certain that people trust other people. And the adage of people love to buy but hate to be sold is absolutely prevalent. So this is just, that's kind of a, a long-winded uh, preamble to, at Insight Pool, what we're specifically doing is a, it's a system of record for word about marketing, and it helps brands figure out who those right particular parties are, get them engaged with the process that Jay very specifically described around something that they would be excited about. Like this is an example with Home Depot and the things that they've done with ESPN Game Day. And the reality is, is that just 43 people created 60 million uh, impressions and then obviously all the other activities like click-throughs, et cetera. But very, very specifically in their target market of people that were talking about backyard and grilling and barbecuing and things that appealed to what were products that they have for sale. As opposed to, you know, you might have spent uh, 20 million bucks on sponsoring game day, um, but all the conversation is about that. 
And so in this particular case, it just showcases the examples of how excited people are, even when Home Depot just happens to reach out to them directly and makes them feel special. And then you can just take a look at like all the retweets and all the favorites and everything else. Well, all the, all those are digital data points and they're footprints that people have left, breadcrumbs, if you will. And so what our software is able to do is to understand like, oh, you did this, this person shared this, now these people came from this, and then they did X, and that's how it filled your funnel, and that created X amount of velocity for you relative to sales or relative to customer engagement, et cetera. And so the, the beauty about it is that I think we live in a day, and it'll sound self-serving, but it's really true that it's no longer a, a nice to have. It's a have to have because everybody else is completely turning away from what was normal. Um, just last quarter alone, it was $21 billion of ads that were not served up because simply people blocked it. And I, iOS will come out with its new blocker. So the reality is, is that you have to figure out a way to connect with people that are really somewhat unconnectable. And the best way of doing that is having sincerity, having truth, and again, having other people do it for you. And so that's what Insight Pool helps operationalize. Fantastic, Devin. Thanks so much. And uh, we're getting ready to do a whole other uh, campaign with uh, our friends at Insight Pool that we're going to launch in the next week, uh, promoting our podcast, Social Pros, uh, to people who love social media and love podcasts. So we're excited to see how that goes as well. Let me tell you about the sixth uh, tip, which is to analyze topic and content to strength. So once you have uh, an, an idea of a pool of potential influencers that you might want to work with. This is where it's, I think, really important to be able to kind of look at them side by side and say, all right, what, what are the differences between these individuals? So you examine each potential influencer's topical and content history. So here are the kind of questions that it would be useful to be able to answer. How often does this person publish about your topic? I think there, there's sort of this legendary uh, problem that happens in influencer marketing today where not, not in Devon's case, because they're usually in actual customers, but, but this happens uh, with lesser uh, companies. And, and especially when people try and DIY this, you know, they, they, they find some sort of software or some sort of like evidence that this person is an expert on lamb or something. And at one point they sent one tweet about a lamb dinner they had, and then now they've been categorized somewhere as lamb experts, right? And the whole thing, it just goes off the rails. So, you know, you, you have to understand, does this person, person actually talk about these issues all the time? Or is it just like a random one-off? How recently have they published uh, about your topic? Have they worked in the past with some of your competitors or with similar companies? And then also, what is their uh, preferred medium? We talked about Snapchat versus, influ uh, versus um, uh, Instagram uh, versus Pinterest versus Vine, etc. How comfortable are the people that you're thinking about working with in social media versus something like blogging or photography versus video content for YouTube or Vine, et cetera. So you have to have a sense for their, their preferred medium as well. So here's a, an example of, uh, of a potential influencer. Uh, this uh, gentleman, his name, as you can see here, is Eric the Car Guy. Eric the Car Guy is a certified master mechanic who makes all kinds of fantastic YouTube videos uh, on, on how to DIY car repair, etc. He's really good, uh, a great YouTube channel, and then he takes the YouTube videos and embeds them on the blog. So if you are, for whatever reason, looking to reach this audience uh, or create content around these kind of themes, Eric the Car Guy might be a good choice. But what you want to look at is, okay, what's the story with Eric the Car Guy? Well, here's his website, it's ericthecarguy.com, and here's who he is, and here's what his site is all about. Um, you know, the production value on the videos is not great, uh, but he's well-spoken, the tutorials are clear and friendly. You know, you, you want to kind of frame this up. And then typically what you'd want to do if you're going to compare multiple influencers to one another is, is look at things like this. How much website traffic does he get? How many Twitter followers does he have? How many Facebook likes does he have? How many YouTube subscribers does he have? Which is particularly important if it's somebody whose influence is primarily in video. Uh, how many Instagram followers? Uh, he's not on Pinterest. Um, and then you can compare Eric the car guy to Jeff the car guy or whomever else the car guy is and get a sense for you know which are the people that, that make the most sense for this particular campaign. 
A seventh tip, and I cannot emphasize this one enough. This is uh, also one of my favorites and, and one that I think will really serve you well. A lot of companies today are getting better at finding the right influencers. They're even getting better at figuring out kind of how they want to use influencers. But then when it comes to approaching the influencers and saying, hey, can we work together? It, it completely falls apart, right? It's like, it's like asking a girl to dance at the eighth grade dance, right? It gets really awkward and terrible. So the key is to approach influencers with specifics. Here's the worst thing you can ever say to somebody when you, influ- when you approach them. Hey, maybe we should think about doing some things together, right? That is a colossal waste of time. So anybody that you're going to try to work with who actually has an audience, who, who, who has a pretty good sized audience, gets pitched all the time now. So you've got to make it really clear what you want from them and how it's going to benefit them. So, you know, I found you online and I was thinking we should work on some things together is definitely the, the wrong approach. So what you should do is include a pitch and, and typically these are email. Include in your pitch uh, a demonstration that you've done your homework, a very specific request, a very clear explanation of of the benefits and expectations, a time limiter, like we're going to make a decision, we're going to start soon, so this can't just sit in somebody's inbox forever, and description of next steps. So I actually wrote a pretend pitch for Eric the Car Guy, who we looked at a couple slides ago. If I was going to send an email to Eric the Car Guy on behalf of a client or behalf of uh, myself uh, or our team, this is kind of sort of how I would write this email, okay? Uh, Hi, Eric. Uh, I'm a fan of your blog and videos. I particularly enjoyed the 1988 Town and Country Transmission Walkthrough as my dad had one when I was a kid. Memories. You do such a great job of making complex things understandable. Thank you. I'm Jay Baer and head up the digital content team for Convince and Convert. Our blog was named the number one content marketing blog in the world and is a resource for readers on vehicle and home maintenance. That, of course, is not true. Fictional example. My team and I have selected you and six other experts as potential contributors to our platform. Our large audience will give you great exposure and your content is perfect for our readers. This is a paid program in exchange for monthly content creation. And we'd also want to sponsor your blog and your videos. We do need to have all participants finalized by August 30th. May we connect on Skype on Monday at 2 p.m. or Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Many thanks, Eric. I hope we are able to work together. See what I mean here? I've demonstrated that I've watched his blog and his videos. I'm not just like, didn't just find him in a database. I demonstrate that I've paid attention. I give him a time limit. I say that's a limited program. I tell him what his benefit is. I make sure he understands that this is a paid program. There's a date and there's a specific next steps. Can we get on Skype on Monday or Tuesday? Okay. He can actually make a decision or at least start to make a decision based on this email. He doesn't need a second, third, fourth, fifth email from you to figure out whether this makes sense. This is the way to do it. The eighth tip is to use the magic triangle. The magic triangle is this. Bloggers and influencers really only care about three things. They care about exclusivity. They care about co-creation. And they care about attention. They don't really even care about money because these three things, if they get them, equals money eventually. The magic triangle is exclusivity co-creation, and attention. Exclusivity is important. If tons and tons and tons of people are participating in the same program, it's less interesting to the influencer because they can't say, I'm part of this thing that other people aren't part of. They're just, it's just by definition less interesting if it's not somewhat exclusive. Co-creation is really important. Influencers don't want to spread your story. They're not a press release service. Right? They want to help you create the story and, and make the story more interesting. Okay, So you can't just say, as, as happens to me all the time, as I mentioned, this happened, please tweet it. It's like, well, no, I'm not really interested in that. They, they want to be a part of it at some level. So you've got to give them that opportunity. And then attention, right? Use your audience to help build their audience. Right? It's the same thing that Devin and I are doing right now. right? So I promoted this webinar to convince and convert. Insight Pool promotes this webinar to their audience, which draws more attention to what I do and what Convince and Convert does. It needs to be a one plus one equals three type of scenario uh, for influencers. That is the magic triangle. 
Those are the eight tips. But wait, my friends, just wait. There is a special bonus tip, tip number nine, which is to build relationships first and then transactions. So here's, and this is hard, don't get me wrong, this is hard to do, but it is important to try to do, which is to identify who you want to work with, but do that way before the program starts. And then ideally what you do is you interact online with that individual, that group of individuals to build name recognition and trust before you need it. So let's say you found 20 influencers that you wanna work with on a program. You should try to have that identify, those people identified two, three, six months in advance. Because during that two, three, six months, you can be tweeting them and retweeting them, commenting on their Facebook page, commenting on their blog, commenting on their YouTube videos, commenting on their Instagram, interacting with them in an organic, natural way during that whole period, use your real name, use your company name. We're not trying to do a fake identity thing here or something like that. You're just interacting with them, right? You're part of their community. You're part of their tribe. Because then when the time comes, two months, three months, six months down the road, where you have to email that person and say, hey, Eric, the car guy, we'd love to work with you. Eric, the car guy is like, hey, that's Devin. That's Devin, the same Devin who comments on my videos all the time. Oh, yeah, I would love to work with Devin. It is incredibly important to try to work this out. And it's really hard, I understand, because I've been in the middle of a lot of these programs where, where big companies say, even small companies say, we need an influencer program. When is it going to start? How about Monday? So, well, I guess this is going to be a cold pitch email then because I don't have enough time in the next three days to build relationships with these people. Insight pool can be a huge, huge help with this particular piece um, of, of the influencer marketing story. Obviously, all the pieces, but this one in particular, insight pool can really help you with to, to, to figure out who these people are and then help nurture and curate those relationships over time, uh, especially in Twitter. So to recap, the eight tips plus the bonus tip, one, build a business case, figure out why you're going to do this at all. Two, learn the difference between audience and influence. Three, craft a story worth telling. Four, start with advocates, the people who are your current customers. Five, discover people with relevant audiences. Six, analyze their content and topic strengths. Seven, approach them specifically, not generally. Eight, use the magic triangle, the three things that influencers care about. And nine, build relationships first before you need them. Devin, let's take some questions. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Jay. Um, so we've had several questions come in. Um, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them, but we are going through them and uh, trying to pick out uh, some of the best, our favorite ones. Um, if you do have any other questions, I still encourage you to post them in the questions tab or on Twitter. Um, Twitter probably will be your best set of a guaranteed response, even if it's just a tweet back. So for the first question from comes from Chris. When you work with marketplace providers who say they can bring you influencers, how can you assess their capabilities and know that they are, they are getting you the influencers with relevant audiences and not just eyeballs that don't matter? Yeah, That's a, a great question. Let me take that one. Yeah, it, yeah it's a great question. And it's, it's really fluid, right? I mean, the marketplace business right now is really fluid. It's the same way any sort of talent agency based business is sometimes fluid. So I think um, the best way to go about that ideally is to say, okay, you remember the slide where I showed the stats on Eric, the car guy, here's his Twitter following and his Facebook and his uh, YouTube and all that. I would want to see that for all the people that the marketplace is going to try and find for me. So I'd want to give them a spreadsheet, almost an RFP that says, I want... 20 people that, that sort of meet these criteria or give me 20 people and then give me a dossier on them so that I can really look at them and measure them side by side. Um, that's, that's how I would go about it. I would, I would try and data my way out of that problem. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then Chris had a second, very small question. And that was just to the Barry example you had. And he just asked, does Barry get paid by the cruise company? Yeah. Uh, it's a revenue share. She gets a commission. Okay. Okay, I think there's just some confusion there. Um, the next question, uh, consumer goods and services companies can offer many things to influencers, whether it be something of monetary value or free services. 
What advice would you give to nonprofits to in- incentivize influencers to join a cause? That's a really good question. Uh, Devin, have you guys done any nonprofit stuff? Do you want to? Yeah. Reference? So, um, you know, it's interesting because every single business, um, it, it, everything works the same exact way. Nonprofits have typically done things, whether it be like dinners and like a really cool host. Um, so those types of things were, you know, human interaction that drove donations. You take this and expand it digitally. Um, we did some things, for example, I can remember one off the top of my head for with um, when the Philippines had a, a really terrible storm and there's a lot of people left homeless. Uh, Downtown Abbey actually uh, wanted to help and we actually ran a social outreach uh, program uh, and connected the right parties that were also fans of the show, uh, but were also engaged in charitable causes and tried, just tried to bring to attention what was happening uh, in the Philippines. And, you know, it drove a 5x uh, increase into what their typical donations were. So the, the average donation was five times more and twice as many as they'd actually received. So, so nonprofits and others could really benefit from it. The trick is, is every single time, though, you decide to embark on an influencer related campaign. And I think, you know, Jay, I'll get your, your opinion on this, but like there's a lot of people that come back and ask questions and do other things. If you're not ready to give them the answers or to, again, just simply um, control your handle on Twitter or whatever it might be to get them, you know, engaged after you've already done this outreach. uh, If you're not there to be responsive, the whole program dies. And uh, that's the one key element, particularly when you're talking about donation bases, when you're trying to appeal to somebody's passion. Uh, they they want to know right then and right there. And I think that's something to hit on is that you can't just do an outreach and then hope that they take the last action that you want. You need to be available, walk them through that. Yeah, that's a really good point, is it, that kind of notion of, of vigilance. And, uh, and you also hit on a, another really key concept for for not just for nonprofits, but really for anybody. I, I did a video about this not too long ago that anytime you're doing anything in marketing, right? At this point, I think you're better off trying to find a way to give away experiences rather than give away stuff. Um, people remember experiences more than they remember stuff. It's just always true. So um, if you don't have, if you don't have product to give away, I don't think that's a bad thing because I think it forces you to create experiences that could actually end up being much more powerful and much more memorable. Um, Another question that came in, how do we convince CEO and CFO types that we have to choose some tribes and allies? I work in the educational sector and there's a lot of trepidation about politics. Jay, do you want to take well, that one? I, yeah. So I think the way to to get around that is to say to leadership, we don't we don't have a homogenous customer base. We have particular types of customers. Um, there might be three, four, five, six different personas in your company that buy things from you for different reasons. And ideally, what you want to try and do is find influencers that match those personas, right? So, so you're, you're trying to find somebody who, who essentially is your customer, and ideally actually is your customer, but even if they're not your customer today, is a stand-in for your particular type of customer. So it's not so much a political issue as it is, let's just try and model our actual customers with somebody who is like a customer but just has a bigger audience and is influential on that topic. And I think when you when you look at it from that perspective and say, look, all we're trying to do is match our customer type with somebody who's influential, it makes it a lot less sticky and, and weird to have those conversations. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, another question that came in was, I've heard a lot about influencers and advocates, and today you talked a lot about influencers. What is the difference between influencers and advocates? Uh, yeah, I should have uh, addressed that specifically. That's a great question. So uh, in my world, an advocate is somebody uh, who is already in your tribe, right? Somebody who who is already a customer, is already an employee, is already a business partner. They're, they're already, they already love you. Um, advocates can be influencers, absolutely. But most influencers are not already advocates, Right. So when I think about advocates, it's somebody who has already given you money um, or is already part of your team. 
Mm-hmm. That's a really great definition. Uh, this is kind of a bit on a different side, but someone asked, how do you build your own personal influence? Yeah, that's a whole a whole webinar or series of webinars yeah. uh, to, to to tackle that one. But I will I will give you one sim- I'll give you one simple answer because uh, I've 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 been asked that question a lot and done a lot of um, speaking and stuff about it. It is all about consistency. Um, it, it is about it is about creating good content and helping other people and building relationships building relationships every day. Uh, for a long period of time, um, there there is there is no such thing as instant influence. It doesn't it doesn't work like that. Um, as I said, I have a, a measure of influence in some corners of digital marketing, but what people never talk about is that I've been doing this for twenty three years, right? It's you know, uh, and 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 every day it sort of builds on. Uh, on yesterday, the, the biggest problem that most people have when they're trying to build influence for themselves is that they want to do it when they're inspired. Uh, and and influence isn't built on inspiration; it's built on perspiration, right? So, w- what have you published today? Who have you helped today? What have you done that other people would find value in today? Not a month ago, not six months ago, not five hours ago. Like you have to keep making donuts um, over and over and over and over. And I firmly believe that if you do that, quality always wins eventually. Okay. Um, and we'll take, we'll take one last question today since it's three o'clock now. Um, and that's out of all of your recommendations, do any of these change or would you add any for B2B clients? I don't, I would change. No, I don't think I'd change any of them. Um, I mean, certainly, certainly the marketplaces and some of the, some of the tools might change a little bit when you're, when you're seeking B2B uh, influencers, but no, I think fundamentally uh, it works the exact same way. And when we do B2B programs versus B2C programs, we, we use the same, uh, the same playbook and, and the same framework. Devin, how about you? Do you guys do anything different for B2B? I think the trick is, is is very much still, uh, you know, humanization because when you're talking about B2B, uh, you know, the, the the worst thing still is because everybody's so used to automated mail merges and this, that, and the other, um, is to to almost use a little bit, um, slightly more ego boost a little bit, if you will. Um, when you think about, you know, B2B, um, people as buyers and, and so forth, that, that helps a little open up the conversations. When you think of big consumer influencers, you know, many times, just like you've even seen, like people get asked so much all the time. And so I think the trick is for B2B, you just need to lower the threshold as to what you consider that level of influence and then give a little bit of an ego boost because they're almost excited when people are asking them to do something. But I wouldn't otherwise change targeting, et cetera. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Jay, for joining us. Um, I don't know if you have any last words for our listeners today. Uh, my last words are uh, are just to kind of work you know, work work through these tips. Uh, it will absolutely help you uh, do better better campaigns. If you haven't uh, worked with Insight Pool in the past, uh, give them a shot. I uh, it's been a great help to to me and my company, and you'll like what they can do for you. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, and I encourage everyone to go check out the Convince and Convert blog. It's tr- it's one of my favorites. Um, and if webinars are your thing and you really love webinars, we do have another webinar on August 26th with Ashu Garg from Foundation Capital. Uh, he's written a beautiful white paper um, that has gotten a lot of attention called Welcome to the Decade of the CMO, the Future of Marketing Technology Landscape and the New CMO. So I encourage you guys to go to, over to insightpool.com um, there's an easy webinar, p- webinars tab, and you can click there. And I encourage you to join us um, in a couple weeks for that webinar as well. So thank you, Jay. Thank you, Devin. And have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone.